everybody. I bet you a lot of people in the room are so young, they're going, what? Who's she? First of all, I want to start by acknowledging, along with everybody in the room, that we're on unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Tooth Nations. Uh, thank you very much, platform guests. All of you, or we shouldn't say all of you, but I know so many of you. David is my second child. Um, Annette, uh, Gwenny, where's Gwenny? She's left already. Uh, Lori and Christy, wonderful, and the rest of you. I'm very honored, very honored to be able to uh, share some time with you today. But I confess I did struggle a little bit uh, about what I could possibly bring to you, you young, smart activists that you don't already know. What can I add of value? And I thought and thought and thought, and of course I write my own speeches now, and I thought for hours and I came up with nothing, absolutely nothing. But then I realized, and David has hinted at this already, then I realized that I do have something that's different from, unique from you. I'm old, I've been around a long time. Uh, in indigenous cultures, I'd be called an elder. And um, in the Jewish culture, they would refer to me as altakakar, which in Yiddish literally translates as old fart. <laughs> so I give my speeches as an altakakar right now. People remind me every day of my glorious aging status. Had one just this morning from my very close friend, Andy Ross. He was reminding me that about 25 years ago, I was his first cabinet minister that he ever met. And I must have been a very young cabinet minister then. Uh, and it was Ron Tuckwood, uh, your union president, who was introducing me to his executive and his new people. And, and Andy reminds me I was his first minister that he'd met. And, uh, Ron introduced Andy as being from uh, transit, and I said, wow, they're really shoving it up your ass, aren't they? <laughs> I hadn't gotten my protocol down by that time, that early. Not like I do now, that's right. The other day I was in Safeway, and I, I've had this more than once, I'm not kidding. I was in the Safeway line and a woman came up to me and said, didn't you used to be Joy McPhail? <laughs> Anyway, let me share with you what I have learned from more than four decades of union political and social activism, both my successes and my failures, and there have been many of both. I grew up in Hamilton in a very proudly union, working class family. My mom was a registered nurse, and she had four of us in 49 months. She really is the hero of the century, I think. My dad was a construction worker operating heavy equipment and they had migrated from the Maritimes uh, looking to leave the poverty of the farm. Uh, our family benefited greatly from union membership. My dad was a member of the operating engineers and he quietly participated in his local, but I do remember, I remember from a very early age those union magazines coming home and it was, my dad was dyslexic and had a grade eight education and it, but it was a magazine that he consumed from beginning to end, and he would discuss it with my mother at our uh, kitchen table. Um, and I also remember the day that he came home, and he was so happy because they had made sure that all four of us went to the dentist regularly, and it came straight out of their pocket. And he was so happy because they had just, the union had just voted for the first dental plan, but unfortunately, they didn't get the pension plan, but he was so excited about that. My mom was much more vocal in her union representation and her activ activism. She was a founding member of the uh, local, uh, of her, her local for the Ontario Nurses Association in the early 70s. And she used to say, I'll never forget this, she used to say that the union made her a prouder nurse. And uh, it still makes me choke up when I think about her saying that. But really, the touchstone of our family was the United Church. I don't think you know that about me, David. Do you? Do you know? Was well, that now you do? The United Church. Um, most neighborhood, neighborhood activities migrated from the uh, United Church, revolved around the United Church. It's where we 
learned that the key to getting ahead was to build a strong community. Success was defined as everybody getting a leg up, everybody being safe and secure and healthy. And in those days, nobody called this social justice. It was not a term that was part of our, our vocabulary in those days, but that's exactly what we tried to live each and every day. So it wasn't until I started going to night school classes at McMaster University studying economics that I realized that the goal of equality was not only not prevalent everywhere, not prevalent everywhere, but that large, frankly, capitalists, capitalist companies, market-based economies rely on social and economic inequality. And I was really confused by that. I, it was just not something that I had experienced. It was not a premise that I had experienced in my life. But mostly I was furious. I was furious to learn that. And I was not going to accept it. And it was game on for that moment forward. And I knew from my upbringing that the best way to join the struggle was through the union movement. And it's been ever thus since then. In the late 70s, many of you will not, most of you will not remember this, in the late 70s and through the 80s, we made some gains at the bargaining table that are now part of almost every collective agreement. Protection from sexual harassment, benefits for part-time workers, maternity leave top-up, adoption leave, family leave, the right to refuse unsafe work, whistleblower protection, the application of seniority and promotions, and those are only to name a few, but I was lucky enough in the late 70s and through the 80s and into the early 90s that that was what we were negotiating in the, at the uh, bargaining table. And now, not only are those standard in our collective agreements, but they're also entrenched in laws that now apply to every worker. These uh, hard-fought gains, though, uh, and more, were threatened several times by anti-union governments un under the time that I've been an adult, both federally and provincially. And the depth and ferocity of those attacks in the 80s by the social credit governments of Bill Bennett and Bill Van Der Zand shook me to my core. The vitriol coming from those governments. In 1983, how long was that? 35 years ago, the Socrates introduced dozens of pieces of legislation that tore at almost every aspect of our collective agreements and at civil society generally. Now we responded, the labor movement and civil society, it was really the first time we worked together, civil society and the labor movement, we responded with Operation Solidarity. Does anybody remember that? Anybody? And the rest of you should be looking at it from your history books, because it was a very, very significant time. But I tell you, in the end, state power prevailed, and all of those heinous laws were passed. They attacked us again in 1987. It was then Premier Van Der Zand. He was a doozy. Um, and he attacked us and ran through a bill, uh, Bill 19. And Bill 19 stripped unionized workers of the right to strike and to organize, and it entrenched dozens of other anti-union measures. That was in 1987. It's not that long ago. Again, we responded. We responded with a general strike. 250,000 of us walked off the job. But in the end, remember that? Does anybody remember that period? Those were unbelievable days. Um, but in the end, state power prevailed again, and the bill passed. That fight continued for the next more than four years, four plus years. It included a complete boycotting of the Labor Relations Board, but it was not going to be resolved until 1991. The lesson I learned from those losses was that real and lasting change can only occur when progressives have state power. I've been active in the NDP for more than a decade in 1991 when the whole province was holding its breath, waiting for the Socrates to uh, call an election, and then uh, people would be able to uh, kick them to the curb, as we'd say. My local MLA announced that he was retiring, and people said, 
We need a woman to run. Uh, there were 10 seats in Vancouver uh, in those days, and uh, there was only one woman running. Hard to believe, but only one woman, woman running, and some people said, Joy, you should do it. Well, back then, it was normal for women to run the election campaigns, to do the fundraising, make the food, recruit the volunteers, clean the campaign room, bathrooms, but to be a candidate? Mm, not so much. That was not on the radar uh, for many people. But I didn't know what I didn't know. So I threw my hat in the ring for the nomination. It was Vancouver Hastings, East Vancouver. Three of us ran for the nomination, and I won by five votes on the second ballot, and my first political nickname was Landslide McPhail. <laughs> Well, the NDP swept the power in October 1991, and I was part of the 51 person caucus. And in 1992, our government, my first government, repealed Bill 19 and replaced it with a progressive labor code. And that was after wide ranging consultation. We didn't ram anything through, we had a wide ranging consultation and state power prevailed again on the side of the progressive movement. Now, I, I do know, okay, but I don't know, I didn't get a chance to hear your remarks. I'm so sorry about that. But I, I do know that the government is once again updating the code. It's the first time since 1992. Did you talk about that? No. Well, let me, uh, because it's new, uh, it's relatively new. Um, so the first update since 1992, and as a, an old union organizer, I pay attention to a lot of this stuff. I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, and I just want to bring to the attention that um, so there were special, there was a panel of special advisors. They traveled the province, they listened to everybody, and they came forward with uh, 29 recommendations. And some of the ones that captured my attention that are of, of great interest um, are that they're uh, recommending an end to contract flipping. That's where the employers switch contracts from unionized service providers to non-unionized providers. Um, and those non-unionized providers end up hiring the formerly unionized workers, usually at lower wages and with no union representation. So they're recommending an end to that. Uh, they're recommending an option for remedial certification when the labor board rules that an employer has engaged in unfair labor practices during certification, um, such as firing union organizers. Uh, they're recommending giving union organizers six months to certify a workplace up from the current 90 days. These are big, big deals. Um, they're recommending extending the statutory freeze on employer changes to worker changes and benefits and working conditions at a newly uh, unionized workplace. And they, uh, they're moving that up to 12 months, the freeze from four months, four months. And there, there's, there's lots more. There's 29 of these. But this is, another, this is a lesson learned. I said I was going to uh, espouse lessons learned from my successes and failures. And this is a lesson learned, that when progressives, the labor movement and civil society, have a government who listens and they act upon uh, their recommendations, you got to give them advice. Just get out of there and give them your advice on uh, these recommendations. Make sure you have your say, because perhaps another government may not ask for your advice. I was grateful to serve the uh, constituents of Vancouver Hastings for 14 years, almost 15 years. And the progressive achievements during that time when we held government were many. And I was fortunate to oversee some of them, name some of them. Uh, we opened community daycare centers. We raised the minimum wage by 25%. We opened up adoption to gay and lesbian couples. We sued tobacco companies for the costs they imposed on our health care system. We legislated joint union management trusteeship of public sector pension plans. We increased um, success, uh, we increased access to full reproductive choices for women. We returned public transit to local control. Uh, we built West Coast Express, the Millennium SkyTrain, and put more buses on the road. We reduced sky uh, class sizes in our primary grades, and we entrenched that provision in the collective agreement 
And you may recall that the teachers had to fight when the Liberals took that out of the collective agreement and legislated it away. You may recall that the teachers had to go all the way to the Supreme Court and wait a decade and a half to say, to be told by the Supreme Court, you were right all along, teachers. provided free breakfast was my favorite, well, all of these are my fave, but we provided free breakfast and lunches at our inner city schools so that the kiddies could learn. Now, every one of my, uh, every one of my cabinet colleagues uh, uh, had a list as long or longer uh, over the 10 years from 1991 to 2001 of achievements by our governments. But then some of you now may remember the election of 2001. And some of you are too young. And that's a blessing. That's an absolute blessing. The NDP was tossed from government, and the Liberals came, swept to power. By the way, this is a history lesson. I'm not being partisan here. <laughs> As chair, I just feel like I can't be partisan. But So it's a history lesson. Just remember that. The NDP were tossed from government and the Liberals swept to power and our caucus, the NDP caucus, was reduced to two members out of 79. Our caucus was reduced to Jenny Kwan and me. But the upside of that was we were the first 100% total female caucus in the, in the Westminster Parliamentary System. And that record still holds. I want you to know. But those were dark days, my friend. Let's not make any mistake about it. The Liberals, one of the first actions by the then Liberal government was to deny us official opposition status, which in turn meant that the two of us literally had no resources to hold the government to account. And they went on a rampage. The first thing they did was to give a giant tax cut and then made massive cuts to everything else to pay for it. They were well ahead of Donald Trump on doing this, let me uh, tell you. They cut union contracts, they outsourced everything they could, they tried to privatize ICBC, they gutted the teacher's contract, there were no more class size provisions, and my good friend Jerry New reminds me of the days that they tried to turn BC Hydro over to Accenture. Um, uh, they uh, got a land protection provisions and they cut safety regulations. And because Jenny and I had almost nothing with which to fight back except our own sweat, the labor movement stepped in and supported us day in and day out with the full weight of every resource they had. It saved us and we mounted a guerrilla fight back that began to have an impact. And I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart for those days. Now, it was not all, it was not all warrior Jenny and war, warrior joy by any stretch of imagination. They were tough, tough days. And one day um, we were visited, we used to have visitors in our office all the time, just people coming by and saying, how are you doing? And one day, former Premier Dave Barrett dropped by our tiny office. Our tiny office in the legislature was located over the French fryer in from the uh, kitchen, the legislative kitchen. And Jenny and I barely had a chance to eat, but we were starving all the time because of the French fry smell. Anyway, Dave Barrett dropped by, and that, was, that day we could hardly take a breath because we were filibustering a bill that was going to uh, contract out thousands of healthcare worker jobs and cut other healthcare workers jobs by wages by 15% and we were exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And I complained to Dave that we were never going to get uh, a win out of this, we were never going to win anything and what good were we achieving anyway? And those of you, you know, a day know that he's very stern, was very stern, was very committed to everything that he believed in, and had a great sense of humor, but he practiced tough love. And he leaned over, he leaned over and shook his finger in my face and said, listen, you two against 77 of those bastards, that's an even match. <laughs> Get in there and fight and you'll beat the hell out of them. 
it wasn't true, but it sure made us go back in there and feel like warriors again. Now, I just want to do a side note because I was looking at your agenda, and I do note that you're going to be debating a resolution on proportional, resol uh, res proportional representation. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Um, and uh, the whole province is discussing this now, and it's a complex matter. There's no question about it. Uh, whether we should switch to PR or stick with our first past the post method. But I just want to say that in that election in 2001, that disastrous election of 2001, where the NDP earns 21.5% of the votes, Jenny and I comprised 2.5% of the seats. The effect of that gross distortion led to dire consequences in the struggle for equality for, for everybody for more than a decade and a half. So just think about that when you're debating that resolution. Anyway, now I'm retired and I can give back even more to community and to the province and I have to, and I have time to think about that inclusive, progressive government, what it looks like, and I can actually watch it in uh, action in Victoria these days. And I can assist in my own way through chair of ICBC. <laughs> Yay, ICBC! Yay! <laughs> Every time I meet with my fellow employees at ICBC, I'm more and more impressed by the intelligence and the commitment, the diversity, the creativity of my fellow employees there. I know that you'll be debating a resolution, interesting timing, right after I step off this stage. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to comment on, uh, on the uh, resolution. Uh, I do hope you have a vigorous uh, debate about it, though. But let me again just offer you a lesson learned that I learned. 20 years ago, the then government of the day, it was an NDP government, conducted a massive review and consultation on ICBC with the goal of introducing no-fault insurance. And those of us who are now in the insurance industry know what that means, and others of you can ask. <laughs> I am. It's too painful to talk about. Um, and I was part of that cabinet. I was part of that deliberation. And we failed miserably, and we withdrew the proposal. But part of our failure came from the fact, arose, because we did not listen carefully to what the union was telling us. Your union. We did not take your advice. And I certainly learned a lesson from that. On the first day of my appointment, but this is the lesson I learned, the first day of my appointment as chair of ICBC, I called your president and asked for his advice. And since then, I have been meeting, uh, there's been an open two-way communication between Annette Toth, who I'm thrilled to see will be staying. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled about that. Uh, the, 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 all of your leadership, your staff, there's been a two-way com communication between them and me, and it's been invaluable, and I do thank you for that. Um, over the course of the next three days, you're going to debate, you're going to deliberate, you're going to disagree, you're going to compromise, you're going to vote, and you're going to enthusiastically represent your 12,000 members. You'll set the agenda for the next few years, you will practice democracy at its best, and I say relish it. I wish you much success. Thank you very much.